the parable that we will hear in the gospel text of today is known popularly as the parable of the prodigal son. However, a more apt name for this parable is the parable of the prodigal father. The real prodigal, profligate, wasteful character in the story is not so much the son as it is the father. It is the father who is wasteful in his love. It is the father who is profligate in his forgiveness. It is the father who is prodigal in his unconditional mercy and compassion. This parable is unique to the Gospel of Luke and is set in the context of the murmurings of the righteous people who lived at that time because Jesus was eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. They could not imagine how a holy and revered rabbi could do this. There is no rationale in the parable in the demand of the younger son. His demand was such that it would result in his father being regarded as dead. It would result also in his breaking his family ties. The father, however, holds nothing back. He gives all he can give to his son. He gives him his very life. This granting of the demand of the younger son results in his progressive estrangement. He first leaves home and his father and goes to a faraway country, even physically estranged from the family. And while he is in that faraway country, he mismanages the money which is given to him. He spends it all on loose living. His descent into poverty and deprivation is swift. He descends so low that he agrees to work for an unbeliever in an unbelieving land tending swine. Swine were considered an abomination to the chosen people who were prohibited from hearing swine. The man who would dare to breathe swine was considered cursed. The younger son became a total destitute and had reached the lowest depth of degradation. However, when he is at the depth of his degradation and in the midst of mire and filth, he comes to his senses. That he is serious about his return is shown in his actions. He prepares his act of contrition, his plea for mercy, and then he acts by getting up from the mire and beginning that journey back to the Father. While the son is still a long way off, the father runs to meet him. In the first century, it was unbecoming for a person to be running. It was considered undignified for grown men to run. The father sets aside respect and dignity. The son begins his speech, but is not allowed to complete it. The father interrupts his son even before the son can finish. He gives instruction to the servant to bring a robe, a ring and sandals, all of which indicate that the son is to be given back his original place as son. The call to kill the fatted calf is a sign that the return of the son is to be regarded as a time of celebration. The dead son has come home alive. The lost son has been found. All sin is forgiven, all iniquity is pardoned, and all guilt is erased by the embrace of the Father. This, however, is only one part of the story and of the parable. The other part has to do with the horizontal dimension, whereas this had to do with the vertical dimension. It has to do with one's relationship with God. The second part of the parable, which is the horizontal dimension, is in which the elder son is introduced. 
And it is equally or possibly more important than the first part. The elder son neither addresses his father as father, nor his brother as brother. His focus is on merit. What he thinks is rightfully his. His focus on what he thinks he has earned. This also leads him to point to the faults of the younger son, his brother. His father, however, wants him to focus on the joy and delight of welcoming his brother who has come back from darkness to light and from death to new life. While many of us can resonate with the first and the third parts of the parable, namely the demand of the younger son for his share and also the unforgiving attitude of the elder son, we find it extremely difficult to believe or even fathom the center of the parable, which concerns the forgiveness of the father, the prodigality of the father. There are two possible reasons why this becomes difficult to digest. The first is that our image of God is warped. We concentrate only on the judgment, on the anger, and on the wrath of God. We forget God's unconditional mercy and love made manifest and revealed so tangibly, so clearly in Jesus. The second reason why we find it difficult to accept the forgiveness of the Father is because we expect God to behave with us in the same way as we behave with others. Since we are often unforgiving like the elder son, we think that God also will be unforgiving with us. However, the truth is that we have been loved first. And as John will tell us in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 19, we love because we have first been loved. If we know the meaning of love, if we know what it means to love, it is only because God in Jesus has shown us how to love. We have been forgiven first. We have been pardoned first. We have been totally accepted by God with all our sicknesses, with all our weaknesses, with all our sinfulness, with all our fragility. Even the first reading of today speaks of this mercy that God had on the people when God rolled away the disgrace of Egypt for Israel. They were given the privilege of eating of the produce of the land. God erased their sin and accepted them even with their failings and their faults. The readings of today throw up a dual challenge. The first is to believe and know that God forgives unconditionally, no matter how grave our sin might be. It is to totally accept the immeasurable depth of God's boundless love. It is to realize in the depths of our beings that God is always willing to take us back if we are willing to move back towards God because God will not coerce, God will not force, God will not put pressure on us to come back, but God will always and ever wait. The second challenge that follows from the first and is related to it is our acceptance and our forgiveness of others as God forgives us. This is the challenge that Paul issues to the Corinthian community in the second reading of today when he invites them and us to be ambassadors, to be those who will represent Jesus. Anyone who claims to be a disciple and a follower of Christ has become a new creation and has now been reconciled to God in Christ. Some of us might be able to identify with the younger son in the gospel text of today. We need to understand that we have been forgiven. Those of us who can identify with the elder son need to realize that we have merited or earned nothing. Whatever is given to us by God is given as a gift. 
Will you accept the un for the love of God, which is totally and completely yours for the asking? Will you stop being self righteous and realize that God gifted not only gifts, but his very self in Jesus? 